and welcome to Relevant History. I'm Dan Toller. Today's episode, I do have to begin with a little bit of bad news. As many of you are no doubt aware, I had been partnering with the Salad Tossers Network. These were some younger guys with a talk show type setup, very different from what we're doing here at Relevant History. And one of those young men, Nick, the ringleader of the group who sort of managed all this stuff, uh, he is no longer with us. Nick died unexpectedly last week. I'll have a little more to say about this later, but for those of you who did follow those guys, I thought you should be aware. With that said, let's get on with the show. The world now, today, in the 21st century, it runs based on the theory of nationalism, which is the theme of this season. Nationalism being the idea that people of a certain nationality, right, of a certain linguistic heritage or ethnicity or religion or some combination of the above, people of a certain nationality have self-rule. They are self-governing. And so... Ideally, each state, right, each government, should be roughly equivalent to a nation. That is at least the theory behind the way the world is currently set up. Even our largest international organization is called the United Nations. And while this principle is more or less universally accepted nowadays, Nationalism is originally a European idea, which would spread first throughout Europe, then throughout the rest of the world via colonization. And like all effective ideas, it would spread to countries that the Europeans did not colonize, and through osmosis. Nationalize, as the Japanese would do, or become a colony. But before nationalism, Europe was dominated by the idea of the universal monarchy. Right? You had the Pope as the spiritual head of humankind, and the Holy Roman Emperor as his secular arm, so to speak. Now, this idea had been bouncing around for a while. No one had ever truly achieved the ideal of an empire encompassing all Christians, which was this idea of the universal monarchy, but people were trying to make it happen, right? Through war, through marriage, through dynastic politics, various families were trying to obtain more and more land for themselves, perhaps none so successfully as the Habsburgs. We recently talked about a character who will appear in today's story, uh, Charles V, who was king of Spain and king of Burgundy and king of all the Low Countries, right, the modern-day Netherlands, and Holy Roman Emperor. Oh, and also king of Austria as a whole part of being the Holy Roman Emperor. Point being, one way or another, he did rule, at least for a time, at least in theory, most of the Christian world. And that's probably the closest anyone came to achieving universal monarchy. We see similar ideas in non-Western, non-European contexts, too, for instance, you had the idea of the Islamic Caliphate. A very similar idea, right? The Caliph would be the universal ruler of all Muslims. There actually was a universal ruler of all Muslims for a while before the Caliphate broke up. And there would be Caliphates of one kind or another all the way up until the end of World War I. 
You see another similar idea in the Chinese view of China being the Middle Kingdom, meaning the center of the world. The emperor of China is the emperor of the world. He just hasn't fully expanded his control outside of China yet. All of these sort of more universal ideas would eventually fall to the idea of nationalism, the idea of popular sovereignty, that the people themselves are what matters, not the land or the noble blood of the leaders. And those ideas would slowly develop over the course of centuries. Different historians will point to different events as the birth of quote-unquote real nationalism, with the American and French revolutions being the most common flashpoints. But the truth is, at least in my humble opinion, that nationalism developed via a slow evolutionary process. You cannot put your finger on a single day in history and say, well, nationalism didn't exist before then, and after then it did. It evolved slowly. But there were some noticeable steps, and perhaps the largest step, at least in the early development of nationalism, was the breakdown of religious unity in the Holy Roman Empire, which is basically modern-day Germany, during the Protestant Reformation. Before the Reformation, the dream of a universal monarchy was very much alive, but by the end of the 16th century, it was on life support, and by the middle of the 17th century, it was as dead as the dream of restoring the Roman Empire. The story of that time period is going to take a few episodes for us to cover, but we're going to start with a clergyman you may have heard of a guy named Martin Luther. And these events are still controversial for many people, so full disclaimer, I was raised Catholic, and while I no longer consider myself religious, I did receive a religious education. So I know the religious doctrines very well, and I have tried to be accurate when talking about those subjects. But even so, if I make a mistake, if I offend anyone, I do apologize. I love you all, and I'm just doing my best to be objective here while still telling a good story. Martin Luther is born on November 10th, 1483, in the county of Mansfeld in modern-day central Germany. This is one of many tiny, semi-independent counties in the vast Holy Roman Empire. Martin's father, Hans Luther, is a wealthy landowner with several copper mines to his name. By the time Martin is nine years old, Hans has been elected to the town council, an influential position and as high as anyone could rise in this society without being of noble blood. As a young teen, Martin attends a series of trivium schools. These are schools that teach the most basic of the liberal arts, grammar, rhetoric, and logic. And at the time, this was a standard education for young people of means. And in Martin's case, his father Hans is hoping that he will go on to study law. By the age of 17... Martin is old enough to attend the University of Erfurt, which he would later say was a beer house and a whorehouse, so not all that different from college today. In 1505, Luther earns his master's degree and returns home for a visit. On his return trip to Erfurt, he gets caught in a storm. The wind is blowing, and lightning is striking everywhere, and the rain is pouring down, and one bolt comes down right near Martin Luther. It startles his horse, it temporarily blinds him, and in a panic, he swears that he will become a monk if God spares him. Those of you who are familiar with the New Testament might notice some parallels here to St. Paul on the road to Damascus. And just like Paul, 
Martin Luther is good to his word to God. He joins the Augustinian monastery of Erfurt on July 17, 1505, at the age of 22. Now, his father Hans is furious. Right? Monks have to take vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience, which basically means no career, certainly no legal career. And well, This is a waste of all the money Hans spent on Martin's education. But as it turns out, the joke is on Hans. See, Luther impresses his superiors with both his piety and his intelligence. In 1507, he is ordained a priest as well as a monk, and in 1508, when a new university is opened in the nearby city of Wittenberg, the dean of the university asks Martin Luther to join the theology faculty. So, young Luther travels to Wittenberg, located in the nearby electorate of Saxony. He spends the next four years earning his doctorate in theology, and he does indeed join the faculty. Two days later, on October 21, 1512, he becomes chair of the theology department, which he would remain for the rest of his life. In fact, the University of Wittenberg would eventually become Martin Luther University of Hall Wittenberg. Take that, Hans. Now, around this time, Luther is also named the Vicar of Saxony and Thuringia for all the Augustinian order. What this means is that he is responsible for making sure that all the monasteries in those areas are conducting themselves appropriately for Augustinian monks. So, not only is he a senior professor of theology, but he is a powerful man in the Catholic Church, and he's not yet 30 years old. From 1512 to 1516, he continues to teach, preach, and study. And he might have been unknown to history if it hadn't been for a Dominican friar named Johann Tetzel. See, at this time, Pope Leo X is continuing the work of his predecessor Julius II, who had begun building a massive new basilica in Rome, a grand church. The old St. Peter's Basilica had fallen into disrepair during the Western Schism, when there were multiple claimants to the papacy. And before that, the Pope had been positioned in France for a number of years, so... The old basilica needs some work, and now, nearly a hundred years after the end of the Western Schism, Pope Leo is planning to build the greatest church in the world. This church, the new St. Peter's Basilica, would ultimately take another 110 years to complete and would not be consecrated until 1626. That's several popes later. Even today, in the 21st century, it stands as one of the greatest architectural achievements in history. But in 1516, it's a broken-down old church with a leaky roof and a handful of blueprints. The building of St. Peter's would cost 46,800,000 ducats, which is tough to convert into modern money because the ducat... It had different weights and values in different places, but this amount works out to roughly five or seven billion dollars in today's money. And to begin work, Leo is going to need to raise at least some of that sum, so he announces the sale of indulgences. Now, an indulgence in Catholic theology is... Forgiveness of sins, right? Uh, so you did a really bad thing, and, you know, God's going to send you to hell or maybe make you spend a long time in purgatory or something, but, you know, if the Pope or a bishop gives you an indulgence, well, then you are forgiven. You no longer have to be punished. Now, this rests on an idea called the Treasure House of Merit, basically... The merits of Christ are infinite, and uh, his 
merits have basically been stored up like in a treasury, and the Pope can dispense that merit whenever he wants to. Now, traditionally, indulgences have been given out for people performing religious acts, going on a pilgrimage to a sacred site, for example. And selling them is technically allowed if someone is giving money for a religious cause, but it's really against the spirit of the thing. But Leo's going to go ahead and start selling indulgences to raise money to build this church. Now, to collect these indulgences, Peter sends out emissaries throughout the world. And that's where Johann Tetzel comes in. See, Tetzel is the Grand Commissioner for Indulgences in all of Germany. All right, he has the Pope's approval to determine who gets an indulgence and how. And let's just say he stretches the idea of an indulgence past anything that had previously been accepted. Here's an example. Uh, in one incident, a nobleman, who may or may not have been trolling Tetzel, he asks if he can buy an indulgence for a future sin. Now, that goes against the idea of an indulgence, because to truly receive an indulgence, you're supposed to be sorry for what you did, and obviously this nobleman is not, because he's still planning on doing it. But Tetzel simply asks this nobleman, well, is it a serious sin? The nobleman says, yes, yes, it's very serious. And Tetzel tells him it will cost a lot of money, but the nobleman pays, and Tetzel gives him a piece of paper saying that he has received forgiveness for one future serious sin. Later on, after Tetzel and his companions have left town, the nobleman and some of his friends catch up with them on the road and beat them up and take all their money. When Tetzel tries to press charges with the local duke, the nobleman simply produces this writ of indulgence and claims that highway robbery is the exact sin that he bought forgiveness for. At this point, I think this guy is definitely trolling Tetzel a little bit, but the local duke agrees and dismisses the charges. Tetzel makes further exaggerations and outright lies about the theology behind indulgences. For example, he claims that you can buy your relatives out of purgatory. He even makes up a catchy jingle. As soon as the gold in the casket rings, the rescued soul to heaven springs. This goes against church teaching entirely, and even a devoted Catholic would recognize that it's wrong. Indulgences only apply to the living. You can pray for souls in purgatory. You can have masses and other religious services offered for their benefit, but the Pope cannot absolve individual people as he can for the living. And Martin Luther sees what's going on, Right, that Tetzel is just basically making things up to sell as many indulgences as he can, and Luther writes a letter to his bishop protesting this. He delivers this letter on October 31st, 1517. But the bishop, a man named Albrecht von Brandenburg, refuses to do anything. This is in part because of his own corruption. He bought his position as bishop, and he owes the Pope a huge sum of money, and he's going to use his share of the indulgence gold to pay for it. Now, this letter that Martin Luther writes to the bishop is sometimes called, always called, the 95 Theses. This is an unfortunate name, since as far as I can tell, there are not actually 95 theses in it. There are 95 statements. Some of them serve as a thesis in and of themselves. Some sort of run together. But anyway, I'm being pedantic there. Uh, another thing to be aware of is that there is a historical legend that Luther actually nailed this letter, the 95 Theses, in, written in Latin, to the door of Wittenberg Cathedral. 
various sources dispute this, which is why I simply say that Martin Luther delivered a letter to the bishop. What is certain, what we can say for sure, is that Bishop Albrecht does not answer this letter, but instead forwards it to Rome to be examined for heresy. And when you hear the text of this letter, you could understand why the Pope might be a little upset, because while Martin Luther talks a lot about indulgences, he also does not make the Pope sound very nice. And while the Pope is going over the 95 Theses in early 1518, Luther's Theses are translated from Latin into German and distributed to the people. They start being read in churches and in pubs throughout the land. Before we go any further, let's take a look at this letter, these 95 Theses. And yes, this is a bit long and it's awfully heavy on religion, but it's important if you want to understand what is going on in people's heads during this time. Luther writes, quote, 1. When our Lord and Master Jesus Christ said, Repent, he willed the entire life of believers to be one of repentance. 2. This word cannot be understood as referring to the sacrament of penance, that is, confession and satisfaction as administered by the clergy. 3. Yet it does not mean solely inner repentance. Such inner repentance is worthless unless it produces various outward mortification of the flesh. 4. The penalty of sin remains as long as the hatred of self, that is, true inner repentance, namely, until our entrance into the kingdom of heaven. 5. The Pope neither desires nor is able to remit any penalties except those imposed by his own authority or that of the canons. 6. The Pope cannot remit any guilt, except by declaring and showing that it has been remitted by God, or, to be sure, by remitting guilt in cases reserved to his judgment. If his right to grant remission in these cases were disregarded, the guilt would certainly remain unforgiven. 7. God remits guilt to no one unless at the same time he humbles him in all things and makes him submissive to the vicar, the priest. 8. The penitential canons are imposed only on the living, and according to the canons themselves, nothing should be imposed on the dying. 9. Therefore, the Holy Spirit, through the Pope, is kind to us in so far as the Pope in his decrees always makes exception of the article of death and of necessity. 10. Those priests act ignorantly and wickedly who, in the case of the dying, reserve canonical penalties for purgatory. 11. Those tares of changing the canonical penalty to the penalty of purgatory were evidently sown while the bishops slept. 12. In former times, canonical penalties were imposed not after but before absolution, as tests of true contrition. 13. The dying are freed by death from all penalties, are already dead as far as the canon laws are concerned, and have a right to be released from them. 14. Imperfect piety or love on the part of the dying person necessarily brings with it great fear, and the smaller the love, the greater the fear. 15. This fear or horror is sufficient in itself, to say nothing of other things, to constitute the penalty of purgatory, since it is very near to the horror of despair. 16. Hell, purgatory, and heaven seem to differ the same as despair, fear, and assurance of salvation. 17. It seems as though for the souls in purgatory, fear should necessarily decrease and love increase. 18. Furthermore, it does not seem proved, either by reason or by scripture, that souls in purgatory are outside the state of merit, that is, unable to grow in love. 19. Nor does it seem proved that souls in purgatory, at least not all of them, are certain and assured of their own salvation, even if we ourselves may be entirely certain of it. 20. 
Therefore, the Pope, when he uses the words plenary remission of all penalties, does not actually mean all penalties, but only those imposed by himself. 21. Thus, those indulgence preachers are in error who say that a man is absolved from every penalty and saved by papal indulgences. 22. As a matter of fact, the Pope remits to souls in purgatory no penalty which, according to canon law, they should have paid in this life. 23. If remission of all penalties whatsoever could be granted to anyone at all, certainly it would be granted only to the most perfect, that is, to very few. 24. For this reason, most people are necessarily deceived by that indiscriminate and high-sounding promise of release from penalty. 25. That power which the Pope has in general over purgatory corresponds to the power which any bishop or curate has in a particular way in his own diocese and parish. 26. The Pope does very well when he grants remission to souls in purgatory, not by the power of the keys which he does not have, but by way of intercession for them. 27. They preach only human doctrines who say that as soon as the money clinks into the money chest, the soul flies out of purgatory. 28. It is certain that when money clinks in the money chest, greed and avarice can be increased. But when the church intercedes, the result is in the hands of God alone. 29. Who knows whether all souls in purgatory wish to be redeemed? since we have exceptions in St. Severinus and St. Pascal as related in a legend. 30. No one is sure of the integrity of his own contrition, much less of having received plenary remission. 31. The man who actually buys indulgences is as rare as he who is really penitent. Indeed, he is exceedingly rare. 32. Those who believe that they can be certain of their salvation because they have indulgence letters will be eternally damned, together with their teachers. 33. Men must especially be on guard against those who say that the Pope's pardons are that inestimable gift of God by which man is to be reconciled to him. 34. For the graces of indulgences are concerned only with the penalties of sacramental satisfaction established by man. 35. They who teach that contrition is not necessary on the part of those who intend to buy souls out of purgatory or to buy confessional privileges preach unchristian doctrine. 36. Any truly repentant Christian has a right to full remission of penalty and guilt, even without indulgence letters. 37. Any true Christian, whether living or dead, participates in all the blessings of Christ and the Church, and this is granted him by God, even without indulgence letters. 38. Nevertheless, papal remission and blessing are by no means to be disregarded, for they are, as I have said, the proclamation of the divine remission. 39. It is very difficult, even for the most learned theologians, at one and the same time to commend to the people the bounty of indulgences and the need of true contrition. 40. A Christian who is truly contrite seeks and loves to pay penalties for his sins. The bounty of indulgences, however, relaxes penalties and causes men to hate them. At least it furnishes occasion for hating them. 41. Papal indulgences must be preached with caution, lest people erroneously think that they are preferable to other good works of love. 42. Christians are to be taught that the Pope does not intend that the buying of indulgences should in any way be compared with works of mercy. 43. Christians are to be taught that he who gives to the poor or lends to the needy does a better deed than he who buys indulgences. 44. Because love grows by works of love, man thereby becomes better. Man does not, however, become better by means of indulgences, but is merely freed from penalties. 45. Christians are to be taught that he who sees a needy man and passes him by, yet gives his money for indulgences, does not buy papal indulgences, but God's wrath. 46. Christians are to be taught that, unless they have more than they need, 
they must reserve enough for their family needs, and by no means squander it on indulgences. 47. Christians are to be taught that the buying of indulgences is a matter of free choice, not commanded. 48. Christians are to be taught that the Pope, in granting indulgences, needs and thus desires their devout prayer more than their money. 49. Christians are to be taught that papal indulgences are useful only if they do not put their trust in them, but very harmful if they lose their fear of God because of them. 50. Christians are to be taught that if the Pope knew the exactions of the indulgence preachers, he would rather that the Basilica of St. Peter were burned to ashes than built up with the skin, flesh, and bones of his sheep. 51. Christians are to be taught that the Pope would and should wish to give of his own money, even though he had to sell the Basilica of St. Peter, to many of those from whom certain hawkers of indulgences cajole money. 52. It is vain to trust in salvation by indulgence letters, even though the indulgence commissary or even the Pope were to offer his soul as security. 53. They are the enemies of Christ and the Pope who forbid altogether the preaching of the Word of God in some churches in order that indulgences may be preached in others. 54. Injury is done to the Word of God when, in the same sermon, an equal or larger amount of time is devoted to indulgences than to the Word. 55. It is certainly the Pope's sentiment that if indulgences, which are a very insignificant thing, are celebrated with one bell, one procession, and one ceremony, then the gospel, which is the very greatest thing, should be preached with a hundred bells, a hundred processions, and a hundred ceremonies. 56. The true treasures of the church, out of which the Pope distributes indulgences, are not sufficiently discussed or known among the people of Christ. 57. That indulgences are not temporal treasures is certainly clear, for many indulgence sellers do not distribute them freely, but only gather them. 58. Nor are they the merits of Christ and the saints, for, even without the Pope, the latter always work grace for the inner man, and the cross, death, and hell for the outer man. 59. St. Lawrence said that the poor of the church were the treasures of the church, but he spoke according to the usage of the word in his own time. 60. Without want of consideration, we say that the keys of the church, given by the merits of Christ, are that treasure. 61. For it is clear that the Pope's power is of itself sufficient for the remission of penalties in cases reserved by himself. 62. The true treasure of the church is the most holy gospel of the glory and grace of God. 63. But this treasure is naturally most odious, for it makes the first to be last. 64. On the other hand, the treasure of indulgences is naturally most acceptable, for it makes the last to be first. 65. Therefore, the treasures of the gospel are nets with which one formerly fished for men of wealth. 66. The treasures of indulgences are nets with which one now fishes for the wealth of men. 67. The indulgences which the demagogues acclaim as the greatest graces are actually understood to be such only in so far as they promote gain. 68. They are nevertheless in truth the most insignificant graces when compared with the grace of God and the piety of the cross. 69. Bishops and curates are bound to admit the commissaries of papal indulgences with all reverence. 70. But they are much more bound to strain their eyes and ears lest these men preach their own dreams instead of what the Pope has commissioned. 71. Let him who speaks against the truth concerning papal indulgences be anathema and accursed. 72. But let him who guards against the lust and license of the indulgence preachers be blessed. 73. Just as the Pope justly thunders against those who by any means whatever contrive harm to the sale of indulgences. 75. Much more does he intend to thunder against those who use indulgences as a pretext to contrive harm to holy love and truth. 75. 
to consider papal indulgences so great that they could absolve a man even if he had done the impossible and had violated the mother of God as madness. 76. We say, on the contrary, that papal indulgences cannot remove the very least of venial sins as far as guilt is concerned. 77. To say that even St. Peter, if he were now Pope, could not grant greater graces is blasphemy against St. Peter and the Pope. 78. We say, on the contrary, that even the present Pope, or any Pope whatsoever, has greater graces at his disposal that is, the gospel, spiritual powers, gifts of healing, etc., as it is written. 79. To say that the cross emblazoned with the papal coat of arms and set up by the indulgence preachers is equal in worth to the cross of Christ is blasphemy. 80. The bishops, curates, and theologians who permit such talk to be spread among the people will have to answer for this. 81. This unbridled preaching of indulgences makes it difficult even for learned men to rescue the reverence which is due the Pope from slander or from the shrewd questions of the laity. 82. Such as, Why does not the Pope empty purgatory for the sake of holy love and the dire need of the souls that are there if he redeems an infinite number of souls for the sake of miserable money with which to build a church? The former reason would be most just, the latter most trivial. 83. Again, why are funeral and anniversary masses for the dead continued, and why does he not return or permit the withdrawal of the endowments funded for them, since it is wrong to pray for the redeemed? 84. Again, what is this new piety of God and the Pope that for a consideration of money they permit a man who is impious and their enemy to buy out of purgatory the pious souls of a friend of God, and not, rather, because of the need of that pious and beloved soul, free it for pure love's sake. 85. Again, why are the penitential canons, long since abrogated and dead in actual fact and through disuse, now satisfied by the granting of indulgences as though they were still alive and in force? 86. Again, why does not the Pope, whose wealth is today greater than the wealth of the richest Crassus, Build this one basilica of St. Peter with his own money, rather than with the money of poor believers. 87. Again, what does the Pope remit or grant to those who by perfect contrition already have a right to full remissions and blessings? 88. What greater blessing could come to the Church than if the Pope were to bestow these remissions and blessings on every believer a hundred times a day, as he now does but once? 89. Since the Pope seeks the salvation of souls rather than money by his indulgences, why does he suspend the indulgences and pardons previously granted when they have equal efficacy? 90. To repress these very sharp arguments of the laity by force alone, and not to resolve them by giving reasons, is to expose the Church and the Pope to the ridicule of their enemies, and to make Christians unhappy. 91. If, therefore, indulgences were preached according to the spirit and intention of the Pope, all these doubts would be readily resolved. Indeed, they would not exist. 92. Away, then, with all those prophets who say to the people of Christ, Peace, peace, and there is no peace. 93. Blessed be all those prophets who say to the people of Christ, Cross, cross, and there is no cross. 94. Christians should be exhorted to be diligent in following Christ their head through penalties, death, and hell. 95. And thus be confident of entering into heaven through many tribulations rather than through the false security of peace. Unquote. That is a lot of strong statements, a lot to digest there. And digest it, the people of Germany do. In fact, a lot more people will digest the 95 Theses over the course of that year. By the end of 1518, Luther's 95 Theses have been translated into multiple languages. They have spread as far as France and even England. 
during this time, during 1518, while the Pope is going over his letter, Luther preaches another doctrine, which is called justification by faith alone. Now, this is, again, one of those things that for modern people might not seem all that important, but it is an in innovation in Christian doctrine. Essentially, what Luther says is that it doesn't really matter what you do in this life, because nobody can ever be good enough to go to their heaven on their own. To go to heaven, to achieve salvation, you have to have faith in Jesus Christ, and that's the only thing that's going to save you. Well, one might ask, why then wouldn't you just say you believed and then go on doing bad things? And Luther's response is that, well, someone who is a real believer will then do good deeds and avoid bad ones because they want to. And that if they're doing bad things, well, they're not a real Christian because obviously they don't really believe what they're saying. This runs counter to the traditional Christian doctrine prior to this where one had to both have faith and do good works. So this is another bone Luther has to pick with the Pope. And at the same time, he also claims that the Bible is the only true source of Christian doctrine, not the Pope. This is all very controversial at the time. And at first, Pope Leo tries to compromise with Luther. As a matter of fact, his nuncio, his ambassador in Saxony, a man named Karl von Milnitz, he charges Johann Tetzel with corruption. And Tetzel is disgraced and retires to a Dominican monastery, and he dies a year later in 1519. So yeah, Tetzel is no longer there selling indulgences in any way he possibly can, but Luther is not satisfied. Also in 1518, uh, Cardinal Cahitan, a papal legate, arrives to question Luther. He and Luther talk, and he is supposed to arrest Luther if Luther persists in his beliefs, but Luther is able to escape. So the Pope tries something else. He sends a theologian, a man named Johann Eck, in July of 1519. And Eck decides that he's going to stop Luther by debating him in public. He is an experienced debater. He thinks he has the better arguments. And, uh, well, if he can just debate Luther in front of all the people, he's going to show them that you know, Luther is wrong and they shouldn't be listening to this crazy Augustinian monk. And Eck is unable to win the debate. He calls Luther a Hussite, that would be a follower of Jan Hus, a Czech religious reformer of a century earlier who was burned at the stake. We talked about him last episode. Well, Eck compares Luther to this guy Hus, and he runs back to warn Pope Leo that he's got a bona fide heretic on his hands. A year later, in June of 1520, the Pope sends Eck back to Saxony with a message. If Luther does not retract his statements within 60 days, he is to be excommunicated. That means he is no longer considered a Christian, he is no longer allowed to attend religious services or receive uh, any religious assistance from the clergy. He is, he is on his own until he retracts his statements. But Luther does not retract his statements. As a matter of fact, in December of 1520, Luther publicly burns the Pope's letter. And it is during this time that he begins referring to the Pope as the Antichrist, the devil's agent on earth. In his paper, The Controversial Luther, American Lutheran theologian Scott X. Hendricks writes, quote, For Luther, the last day was at hand, and faith was under attack. 
The devil was at work everywhere, and potentially in everyone. The god of this world lies in wait for us through the pope, the emperor, and even through our own teachers. The pope was the antichrist because his office was the agency through which the devil was attacking the faith from inside the church. The purpose of rejecting the papacy, then, was not to start a new church, or for that matter, to split the old one, but to protect the faithful from the jurisdiction of that office through which, in Luther's eyes, the devil was most insidiously at work. In ecclesiastical terms, exclusion of papal jurisdiction from Saxony and other Protestant territories eventually meant different churches, but Luther did not equate the rejection of the papacy with the permanent establishment of a new church. For Luther himself, the Reformation instead was a holding action in the face of the devil's final furious assault before the last day should arrive. Luther lived 27 more years after he first identified the papacy with the Antichrist, and perhaps he should have realized that the end had not come. Unquote. In January 1521, Holy Roman Emperor Charles V that guy we briefly talked about, who is also King of Spain and Duke of Burgundy in the Low Countries, etc., etc., uh, he calls an imperial diet at the city of Worms. A diet is a meeting of all the senior leaders of the empire. This is a big deal. There are, give or take, 300 different polities within the empire. Some of those are big, like the Kingdom of Bohemia, and some are you know, very small, like a particular monastery that is self-governing. But all of these various leaders within the empire come to meet at the city of Worms. And this diet is unfortunately called the Diet of Worms, which sounds like a really disgusting weight loss fad. But uh, anyway, one of the purposes of this diet is to address Luther and his teachings. It's not the only purpose. The emperor also has some administrative stuff he wants to go over with everybody, but taking care of Luther, figuring out how to deal with him, is one of the main purposes of the Diet of Worms. And Luther himself is ordered to attend, but he hesitates. And if you listened to our last episode, you will probably have figured out why, uh, Jan Hus went to a diet like this and ended up being burned at the stake. But John the Steadfast, this is the Duke of Saxony, who is a fan of Martin Luther and his protector, he convinces Charles to promise Luther safe passage to and from the diet. He's not going to be harmed coming or going, uh, because he was summoned. On his way, crowds line the sides of the road, cheering him on. Every major town in Germany, in the Holy Roman Empire, has a printing press, and Luther's writings have preceded him. At the Diet, Johann Eck confronts him, and orders him again to recant his views. Luther answers famously, quote, Unless I am convinced by the testimony of the scriptures or by clear reason, for I do not trust either in the Pope or in councils alone, since it is well known that they have often erred and contradicted themselves, I am bound by the scriptures I have quoted, and my conscience is captive to the word of God. I cannot and will not recant anything since it is neither safe nor right to go against conscience. Here I stand, I can do no other. Unquote. Two days later, on May 25th, 1521, Emperor Charles V issues a decree declaring Luther an outlaw. In part, it reads, Quote, we forbid anyone from this time forward to dare, either by words or by deeds, to receive, defend, sustain, or favor the said Martin Luther. On the contrary, we want him to be apprehended and punished as a notorious heretic as he deserves, to be brought personally before us or to be securely guarded until those who have captured him inform us, 
whereupon we will order the appropriate manner of proceeding against the said Luther. Those who will help in his capture will be rewarded generously for their good work. Unquote. But Luther still has two days of safe conduct left before anybody is allowed to touch him. So he hightails it back towards Wittenberg, which is in the uh, Duchy of Saxony and uh, is where he can be protected by uh, John the Steadfast. But before he can get there, uh, Frederick III, who is uh, John the Steadfast's older brother and the elector of Saxony, basically the senior duke, to uh, simplify it, uh, he stages an intervention. He has some of his men dress up as highway robbers, and they ambush Martin Luther on the road and kidnap him. And Frederick has Luther taken to the castle of Wartburg in Eisenach, central Germany. This is for his own protection. Frederick thinks that if Luther goes back to Wittenberg, even though John will protect him, there might be somebody in the city who decides to arrest him or, or something like that. Uh, so Frederick is going to keep Martin Luther safe in this castle of Wartburg. And throughout the rest of 1521, Luther continues writing, publishing essays against the Catholic sacrament of confession. Uh, he publishes another essay against the keeping of monastic vows. He says that since salvation only comes through faith, the taking of religious vows is actually sinful, since it's an attempt to gain heaven through actions alone. And while these writings are being published, Luther's location is a closely held secret. Uh, Frederick claims to have no idea where he's hiding. Now, ironically, Frederick is a Catholic. Right? He is not a Lutheran, which is what people are at this time starting to call Luther's followers. But he also has no love for the emperor or the Habsburg family, who dominates so much of Europe. In addition, the way the empire's tax structure is set up, uh, it funnels huge sums of money directly to the Pope, money that Frederick would otherwise be able to use for himself. So if Luther can weaken the emperor and the church, Frederick will get to keep this money and his power will grow. It's great for everybody. Martin Luther will not remain in exile in Eisenach for very long. See, back in Wittenberg at the university, one of Luther's colleagues, a man named Andreas Karlstadt, is preaching Lutheranism, and much of the population has converted to this new flavor of Christianity. But Luther is not the only game in town. There are other people preaching even more radical reforms. New preachers appear in Wittenberg, teaching even more radical ideas like withholding baptism until adulthood, which was a big no-no in the Catholic faith. And these reforms are considered radical even by Lutheran standards. These people come to be known as anti-Baptists, or Anabaptists, later confusingly simply called Baptists. They also teach that the Holy Spirit is superior to the Bible and speaks directly to people's hearts. And most frighteningly for the secular leaders of the time, they preach the equality of all people and promote an early form of communism. This puts Luther in a curious position. See, while he is considered the founder of the Reformation, so to speak, he now stands as a conservative force against the radicals. So, still wanted dead or alive by the emperor, he nonetheless leaves exile and returns to Wittenberg. There, he preaches against the excesses of the radical reformers, and these preachers are expelled from the city. But the Anabaptists simply go preach elsewhere, and soon they have gained a huge following of their own. Shortly thereafter, 
a peasant revolt breaks out across the northern part of the Holy Roman Empire, largely inspired by Anabaptist teachings on equality. But there is no central leadership, and the rebellion turns into nothing more than widespread looting and burning, mostly of church property, but also of other wealthy people's property. So in 1525, Martin Luther publishes one of his most famous pamphlets, a pamphlet called Against the Robbing and Murdering Hordes of Peasants. In it, he says in part, quote, If the ruler is a Christian and tolerates the gospel so that the peasants have no appearance of a case against him, he should proceed with fear. First, he must take the matter to God, confessing that we have deserved these things, and remembering that God may, perhaps, have thus aroused the devil as a punishment upon all Germany. Then he should humbly pray for help against the devil, for we are battling not only against flesh and blood, but against spiritual wickedness in the air, and this must be attacked with prayer. Then, when our hearts are so turned to God that we are ready to let his divine will be done, Whether he will or will not have us be princes and lords, we must go beyond our duty and offer the mad peasants an opportunity to come to terms, even though they are not worthy of it. Finally, if that does not help, then swiftly grasp the sword. For a prince and lord must remember that in this case he is God's minister and the servant of his wrath, to whom the sword is committed for the use upon such fellows, and that he sins as greatly against God if he does not punish and protect and does not fulfill the duties of his office, as does one to whom the sword has not been committed when he commits a murder. If he can punish and does not, even though the punishment consists in the taking of life and the shedding of blood, then he is guilty of all the murder and all the evil which these fellows commit, because, by willful neglect of the divine command, he permits them to practice their wickedness, though he can prevent it, and is in duty bound to do so. Here, then, there is no time for sleeping, no patience or mercy. It is the time of the sword, not the day of grace. Unquote. By the end of 1525, the peasants' revolt has been put down. In the process, approximately 100,000 peasants are indeed put to the sword. At this point, Martin Luther is 42 years old, and he remains officially a wanted man. But the princes and dukes of the Holy Roman Empire need him to restrain these more radical elements, so nobody arrests him. After his return to Wittenberg, Luther also makes good on his teaching that priests and nuns should shed their vows. In early 1523, he receives a letter from a group of nuns in a convent at the nearby town of Brenna. Some of these women simply regret taking their vows. Others had been forced into religious life by their families. This was the case with their leader, a woman named Katharina von Bora, who had been given to the nuns at the age of five. Regardless of whether they took their oaths voluntarily or not, none of them are free to leave. In these days, monastic vows have the force of law behind them. So, Luther contacts his friend Leonhard Cope, a respectable merchant who makes regular deliveries of herring to the convent. On April 4th, 1523, Cope makes a delivery, and as usual, he loads up his wagon with empty barrels from his last delivery. But this time, these barrels aren't actually empty. The escaping nuns have hidden inside. At first, Luther tries to convince the former nuns' families to take them back, but none of the families will. Even the families who are willing to do so fear the consequences of violating church law. So instead, Martin Luther sets about finding husbands for all of these women. This is very important in a time when women were not accepted in most jobs, and it was very difficult for a single woman to support herself. By 1525, he has succeeded in finding husbands for all but one of the nuns. 
That is their leader, Katharina von Bora. And she refuses to marry anyone but Luther or his close friend, Nicholas von Amstorf, who is another major leading reformer. On June 13, 1525, Katharina and Martin Luther are married, with Luther's father Hans in attendance. She becomes Katharina Luther. She will go on to bear six children, the oldest of which will actually be named Hans, after Martin's father. She is also an important figure in her own right, helping Luther with many of his later essays. While in Wittenberg in this period between 1522 and 1530, Luther translates the Latin Mass into German and also makes a few modifications to conform it to the new Lutheran beliefs. This German Mass becomes widely practiced, thanks in part to Luther's partnership with John the Steadfast, the Saxon Duke. At the same time, Luther has become wary of preaching directly to the people. He has seen this peasant's revolt and the bloodshed and the outcome of that. He doesn't want another rebellion to break out. So instead, he works more closely with the nobility. He partners not just with John the Steadfast, but also with Philip of Hesse, as well as several smaller local lords. With their help, he funds Lutheran churches, priests, and even bishops. This becomes easier to do in the year 1526. Embroiled in a war against the Turks in the east and the French in the west, Holy Roman Emperor Charles V needs his entire empire at his back, not fighting amongst themselves. So, he sends his brother Ferdinand to negotiate a temporary religious truce between the Lutheran and Catholic princes. They all meet, they have another imperial diet, and at this diet, the Diet of Spare, they establish the principle of quius regio, ius religio, that's Latin for whose realm their religion. Basically means that at least for now, if there is a Catholic duke, or prince, or count, or other local leader, then the people have to be Catholic. And if the leader is Lutheran, well, then the Lutheran services will be practiced in all the churches. Lutherans continue to be persecuted in lands that are directly ruled by the Habsburgs, by the imperial family, but in much of the empire, particularly in northern Germany, far from the Habsburgs, Austrian homeland, Lutheranism becomes the official state religion. As a matter of fact, it spreads beyond the empire. It becomes the official religion of Sweden when King Gustav seizes church-owned lands and appoints Lutheran bishops. But this religious peace is only a temporary truce. It's only to bring everybody together to fight the Turks and the French. Well, by 1529, peace has broken out with the French, and Charles V calls a second diet at Spare. At the 1529 diet at Spare, the emperor declares that Luther's conviction of heresy is to be upheld, and the practice of the Lutheran religion is to be banned. The Diet takes a vote, and the majority votes for the Emperor's position. But six major princes in fourteen free cities lodge a formal protest against the Diet, which becomes known as the Protestation at Spare, and they leave, they walk out. And from here on out, non-Catholic Western Christians are collectively referred to as Protestants. Literally, people who have protested. Well, a year later, in 1530, the Austrian capital of Vienna is once again under siege by the Ottomans, and Charles V realizes that he may perhaps have been too hasty, so he calls yet another diet, the Diet of Augsburg. Here, 
He invites the Protestant princes to present a document containing their arguments with the Catholic faith. And the Protestants come up with this document called the Augsburg Confession. It's basically a long statement of the Lutheran Christian beliefs and how they differ uh, from Catholicism. And indeed, this Augsburg Confession remains the foundational statement of belief for the modern Lutheran Church. But the Confession is still too radical for Charles, so... He wants to have a little debate, he wants some compromise, so he gives the Catholic princes six weeks to write a rebuttal to the Augsburg Confession. And they do, and Charles compares the two and comes to the conclusion that there is no room for compromise, but he still needs his empire unified to fight the Ottomans. Meanwhile, the Protestant princes know that they are on borrowed time. On February 27, 1531, John Frederick I, son of John the Steadfast and now elector of Saxony in his own right, joins up with Philip I, the Landgrave of Hesse, and they meet in the town of Schmalkalden, and they sign an agreement of mutual defense in case they should be attacked by the emperor. This marks the beginning of what will come to be called the Schmalkaldic League, which is a group of Protestant members of the Holy Roman Empire who agree to defend each other. In the face of this, with no alternative and help badly needed against the Turks, Charles V declares a religious peace, which is now known as the Nuremberg Religious Peace. And that peace will last all the way until 1548, so a good 17 years. And this policy is successful. The unified empire is able to fight back the Turks. As a matter of fact, even Martin Luther is on board. In 1529, he has published a tract encouraging Charles to defend the empire. For once, there is something that the Protestants and Catholics can agree on. Meanwhile, Protestantism continues to spread. In the year 1535, the leaders of Württemberg, Anhalt, and Pomerania join the Schmalkaldic League as Lutherans. They do so along with the free cities of Frankfurt, Anhalt, and Kempton. Denmark, which was not even a part of the Holy Roman Empire, would join the Schmalkaldic League in 1538, and the Palatinate, which is an important region of the empire, they would join in 1545. Throughout this time, Charles V and his imperial army are constantly at war, mostly with the Turks. But when he nearly makes some major gains uh, with his invasion of Tunis in 1535, the French join the war on the Ottoman side. This would lead eventually to another war between France, the Ottomans, and the Empire, the so-called Italian War of 1536 through 1538. This war would end in a truce, but the war between the Empire and the Ottomans would go on until 1571 with various breaks and truces in between. And throughout this time, throughout the 1530s, Martin Luther continues propagating his own brand of Reformed Christianity. He publishes a number of hymns to teach Lutheran doctrine through song. How better to get people to remember the tenets of their faith than to have them all singing about it in their own language. And along the same lines, he completes his translation of the Bible into German. This is important. Prior to this time, in all of Western Christianity, scripture and religious services were all maintained in Latin. The argument against this is that only educated people could read and understand Latin. 
In the old days of the church, it made sense to work in Latin because it was the universal language of the Roman Empire. Well, Latin and Greek, but we'll forget about Greek for a time, right? We're talking about Western Christianity, and in the West, Latin was the lingua franca of most people. But by the 1500s, it's been like a thousand years since Latin was universally spoken. Right? There are parish priests in many areas who read the Mass and read the Bible to people in Latin, and they don't even know what it means. Right? They've been educated enough to be able to read and pronounce the words, but you know, even a lot of priests don't understand what they're reading. So, by translating all of these things into German, Martin Luther is making them accessible to the local people. Now, on the other hand, what you will see over time is that each national church, so to speak, will have its own translations. And sometimes, if you're familiar with a translation at all, you know it can get messy, and when you translate the same Latin text into ten different languages, you get ten different shades of meaning. You get ten different interpretations that jive more with people in a particular area as opposed to people in the Christian world at large. This is an important development for nationalism. And it is a practice that would spread very quickly. Again, this is the age of the printing press. No longer do Bibles have to be copied laboriously by hand. You can make your translation and get a printing press and print off however many copies you want relatively quickly. And at the same time as Luther is pursuing these reforms, he is still battling against the radical reformers. He is still, in many senses, a conservative. For example, at one time there is a radical preacher named Ulrich Zwingli uh, who denies that Christ is really present in the Eucharist, right? The bread and wine blessed by the priest during the Mass. And Luther debates him in public, taking the position that after the priest says the words of consecration, that the bread and wine literally turn into Jesus Christ. And at one point, he takes out a piece of chalk and writes the biblical quote, this is my body, on the table between them. So, again, a complicated guy in the history of the Protestant Reformation. He is not nearly as radical as most of the other reformers. But eventually, there will be a scandal that even Martin Luther cannot fully recover from. In the year 1539, Philip I, Landgrave of Hesse, and one of the founders of the Schmalkaldic League, if you'll recall, well, he wants to marry one of his wife's ladies-in-waiting. And he asks a group of priests, including Martin Luther, for advice. Unable to convince him not to do this, and unwilling to lose the support of a key political backer, Luther ultimately advises Philip to marry the lady as well as his wife. Since bigamy, having two wives, is not as bad as divorce. Not quite sure where Luther's getting that from, but... That's what he says, and he also advises Philip to keep the whole affair secret. Well, almost immediately, Philip's sister blows the lid off the whole thing, and Luther's only advice to Philip is to, quote, tell a good, strong lie, unquote, rather than to admit to the affair. And Philip does lie, but it's transparently obvious that he's married to two women, the handmaiden, Marguerite, as a matter of fact, goes on to bear him nine children. And Luther's complicity with this lowers his standing with many of his followers. Meanwhile, Luther's health is declining. 
He suffers from tinnitus, ringing of the ears. He has a cataract in one eye, and he has frequent painful kidney stones. And in the late 1530s, he starts experiencing chest pains, and he realizes that the end is not far off. It's during this time, towards the end of his life, that Luther writes many of his most unpleasant tracts. While Luther has always been anti-Semitic, which is sadly normal for this time and place, he begins lashing out at anyone and everyone, but even so, in his last sermon on February 15, 1546, he preaches that the Jews should be driven out of all Christian territory. Perhaps he has become a little more radical, or perhaps those kidney stones are getting to him. Either way, two days after his final sermon, on the night of February 17, 1546, after attending a business meeting to ensure that his father's inheritance would go to his siblings, Luther suffers a heart attack. And on his deathbed, Two of his followers ask if he still stands by his teachings, and he says yes. Soon after, he has a stroke, and does not speak again before passing away in the wee hours of February 18, 1546, at the age of 62. As long as Martin Luther was alive, the religious peace in the empire held. With his death, Protestants and Catholics alike begin to panic. Catholic leaders become concerned that some of the more radical reformers will gain influence. Some of the Protestant leaders worry that the Catholic leaders will use this as an excuse to attack. Not only that, but the Holy Roman Empire and France sign a peace treaty the same year that Martin Luther dies. Charles V is at long last free to enforce religious unity in the empire. Charles gathers a joint Spanish imperial army of over 50,000 men, and he positions them at the Danube River, which is the de facto border between Protestant and Catholic territory in the Holy Roman Empire. But Charles does not actually strike the first blow. The Schmalkaldic League strikes first. They occupy the Catholic town of Fusen on the other side of the Danube River. They also depose Duke Henry V of Brunswick, who is the last Catholic leader in northern Germany. And they seize his lands, and they confiscate church property in the territory. This is a violation of the religious peace, and it is an open rebellion against the empire. But the Schmalkaldic League was meant to be a defensive alliance. Several of the smaller Protestant free cities protest this move against Brunswick, and they withdraw their support from the League. At the same time, many smaller Catholic imperial states also remain neutral, unwilling to engage in a destructive civil war. Hence the reason that Charles' army is almost entirely Austrian and Spanish, he has to take them from his own personal lands. But even with the size of the Schmalkaldic League reduced, John Frederick and Philip of Hesse invade the Austrian Tyrol. This is a mountainous country rich in silver mines. It is the source of much of the Habsburg wealth. But their invasion is delayed. They take too long, and more troops from Charles's Italian territories are able to reinforce his army. Charles is also able to bribe John Frederick's cousin, Maurice, the Duke of Saxony, to take the Catholic side, even though Maurice himself is a Protestant. Charles promises him all kinds of lands and power, and so Maurice partners with Ferdinand I, the King of Bohemia, and invades 
his cousin's lands. And John Frederick is then forced to return home and defend his homeland. And while he is successful in pushing Maurice out of his part of Saxony, he leaves Philip of Hesse alone to face the imperial army, and rather than do that, Philip withdraws from the Austrian Tyrol back north of the Danube. In early 1547, Charles pursues. By now, Emperor Charles V is old and sick and plagued by gout, but he can still fight, and he defeats the Palatinate and forces them out of the war. He and his Italian ally, the Duke of Alba, catch up with the remaining Schmalkaldic League troops at the River Elba on April 23, 1547. That night, a dense fog blankets the river, with the Catholic forces on one side and the Protestant forces on the other. But in the morning twilight on April 24th, advance imperial troops swim across the river, surprise the Protestant sentries on the far shore, and kill them. And then more imperial troops begin to cross. By the time John Frederick realizes they've gotten across, it's too late. He can't push them back and he's going to have to fight. He orders his troops to retreat to a nearby tree line where they can form up for battle with the forest at their back. But this gives the Catholic forces the shoreline and Charles is able to cross. His 13,000 infantry and over 4,000 knights outnumber the Protestants more than two to one. The knights attack the Protestant flanks and force those soldiers to flee. After that, the center of the Protestant line cannot hold against superior numbers of well-armed Spanish infantry, and they also retreat. Almost all of them are either killed or captured in the forest. John Frederick himself is captured, and he is forced to give his cousin Maurice, the one who betrayed him, the title of Elector of Saxony. He is also forced to hand over the city of Wittenberg, the famous home of Martin Luther. In the aftermath, Charles V famously declares in Spanish, Vine vi y vencio Dios, which means, I came, I saw, and God conquered. Interesting twist on the famous quote from Julius Caesar. A few days later, the last remaining leader of the Schmalkaldic League, Philip of Hesse, also surrenders. He does so without a fight, knowing that alone he stands no chance of fighting the Imperial Army, and he throws himself on Charles' mercy. But Charles has him imprisoned anyway. This angers many Imperial leaders, including many Catholics, who start to wonder what Charles might throw them in prison for. In the aftermath, Charles calls yet another Diet of Augsburg, which lasts from late 1547 through early 1548. At this Diet, Charles orders all Protestants in the Empire to resume practicing Catholicism, including renouncing their beliefs and accepting all seven of the Catholic sacraments. His only concession is that Protestant priests will be allowed to remain so long as they conform to the Catholic faith. Well, this does not sit well with many of the Protestants, and a few years later, in late 1551, there will be another rebellion by the Protestant princes, this one known as the Second Schmalkaldic War. Ironically, it would be led by none other than Maurice of Saxony, the same guy who just betrayed John Frederick in the First Schmalkaldic War. See, there have been varying levels of compliance with Charles's directive, and among others, the city of Magdeburg has refused to abide by Charles's terms, and they continue to practice Lutheranism. So Charles orders Maurice to punish them, and Maurice leads an army to Magdeburg only to take the city's side in open rebellion. 
and several other princes join. And then in early 1552, the other shoe drops. The Protestant side garners additional support from French King Henry II, who promises military aid in exchange for a few Protestant cities along the French border. Henry is Catholic, but he'll do just about anything to take the Habsburgs down a peg. That very year, the French do indeed attack imperial holdings along the Rhine River, while the Protestant princes again strike south into the Austrian Tyrol. The Catholic princes in the empire remain largely neutral, unwilling to enhance Charles's imperial power any more. Charles knows he can't win this war. He can't fight the French and his own rebellious princes who are occupying one of his wealthiest regions. So he sues for peace. In August 1552, he and the princes signed the Peace of Passau, guaranteeing religious freedom for Lutherans and releasing John Frederick and Philip of Hesse from prison. In 1555, this peace is further refined in the Peace of Augsburg, which is the outcome of one more imperial diet in that city. In the Peace of Augsburg, the principle of quius regio eius religio, at whose realm their religion, that principle is formally reestablished. The lone exception to the rule is for bishoprics, which are areas ruled by bishops and owned by the church. And in that case, uh, if a bishop converts to Protestantism, they have to give up their position. There is a final secret clause that makes exceptions for knights and other lower nobility who, because of the mobile nature of their jobs, need a little bit more religious freedom. The Peace of Augsburg only applies to Catholics and Lutherans. So if you are a duke or a count or a prince, you can be Catholic, you can be Lutheran, um, but if you're a Calvinist or an Anabaptist, you're going to be in trouble. And members of those particular creeds continue to be persecuted in both Catholic and Lutheran territories. What's interesting about this time is that during the various religious wars here, even before the first Schmalkaldic War, there are actually reforms taking place within the Catholic Church, finally. In 1545, Pope Paul III calls the Council of Trent to discuss the sale of indulgences and other abuses. Now, this council will last until 1563, well after the Peace of Augsburg is established, giving religious freedom to Lutherans, at least, within the empire. And the Council of Trent, well, for the Lutherans, at least, it's a bit of a mixed bag. On the one hand, it upholds traditional Catholic doctrine on the Pope and the Eucharist and the other sacraments of the Catholic Church. Interestingly, the Council agrees with Martin Luther that there is no useful purpose to clerical celibacy. And then they proceed to take no action on that front, and to modern times, despite there being a shortage of priests, Catholic priests are still not allowed to marry. However, the Council does take a hard line on the sale of religious offices, as well as the sale of indulgences. Children of popes and bishops are no longer allowed to receive positions via nepotism. And you can no longer buy your way to being one of the most powerful bishops in the church. In addition, the council gives birth, at least indirectly, to a new order of Catholic priests, the Jesuits. A Spanish soldier in imperial service named Ignatius of Loyola, founds this new religious order to teach both religion and literacy not just to the nobility, but to the common people. No longer will scholarly knowledge be cloaked in Latin, 
it will be taken directly to the people. And to this day, the Jesuits run some of the finest universities in the world. But by the time the council ends in 1563, it's too little too late. After more than 300 years of these kinds of church abuses, I mean the sale of religious offices and the sale of indulgences, after all of that, the Protestants have had enough. Few people in Lutheran territories listen either because they genuinely hold to Lutheran doctrine, or because Lucy has already pulled away the football one too many times. There have been previous promises of church reform that came to nothing. So by now, Protestantism is entrenched in Europe. Over the following decades, there will be Protestant revolts in France, and the Protestant Netherlands will rebel against their Habsburg overlords, ultimately leading to the collapse of Habsburg dominance over Europe and the end of their dream of universal monarchy. Henry VIII, by this time, has already also split from the Catholic Church and founded the Church of England. So in the course of one generation, the Habsburgs have gone from ruling more than half of Europe to having their dream of universal monarchy dashed by reality. The Peace of Augsburg would hold until 1618, a good 63 years after it was established. When the peace does collapse, it will lead to the Thirty Years' War, one of the most devastating wars in history, certainly in European history. This would further erode imperial authority and ultimately lead to the breakup of the Holy Roman Empire and, further down the line, the formation of modern-day Germany. But in the meantime, the religious peace would have deep implications. Instead of a global religious authority in the Christian world, there were now many. Each local prince or duke would set their own religious course. England, among others, would end up founding its own national church. This leads to the fragmentation of Europe. With religion split by region, there is no more overarching religious authority. The Pope is no longer supreme and Leaders make war and peace without concern for what he thinks. The foundation of national churches, the establishment of religion on an official national basis instead of a universal one, would be one more stepping stone on the road to the modern nation-state. And that's why it's relevant. Greetings once again, it's Dan, and I'm here to let you know about a few things we're doing to expand the relevant history universe. For one thing, if you had not heard about it yet, we do have a Patreon channel. You can find the link to that in the description, and what this channel offers is exclusive access, yes, exclusive for members only, to a new series called Dan's War College. This is a monthly video series with videos uh, about a half hour long where I myself, Dan Toller, explore and break down military battles or units or tactics from history and explain why they worked or didn't work, as the case may be. You get all of this as well as a shout out on the main Relevant History show for $5 a month. Alternatively, if you would like to support the show uh, with a smaller contribution, you can also find a link in the episode description to the Salad Tossers Patreon network. Now, as you might imagine, this is a network of more irreverent creators, and on their channel, I show a little bit more irreverent side. That series is called Irrelevant History, and there we discuss 
interesting historical novelties, such as the bear that served in the Polish army in World War II. Once again, you can find the link to that in the episode description as well, and that comes at the low, low price of $1 per month. But you don't have to spend money to support the show. As a matter of fact, one of the most helpful things you could do is leave a review or a nice positive rating on one of the many podcast distribution services. If you listen on iTunes or Google Podcasts or Spotify or wherever you happen to listen, if you leave a review or a rating, it really does help other people find the show. And while you're at it, make sure to share and tell your friends. If you like it, chances are you know a few other people who will as well. Last but not least, if you want to get a hold of me, whether because I made a mistake or Whatever other reason you'd like to get in touch, you can find Relevant History on Twitter at Dan Toller Podcast. That's Dan T O L E R Podcast. Or you can find the show on Facebook at Dan Toller. That's Dan dot Toller. And it will be the Dan Toller with the Relevant History logo, not one of the individual people profiles out there. Uh, finally, you can send me an email at Dan Toller Podcast at gmail.com. That's Dan, T-O-L-E-R, podcast, at gmail.com. For all other show-related things, including links to my blog posts, which have not been updated in quite some time, well, you can find all of that at dantollerpodcast.com. That's Dan, T-O-L-E-R, podcast.com. Thanks for listening.